Heston. Possibly. Possibly, Felix, although David Lloyd Heston has its own charm, I feel. Um, we're very lucky, actually, because we have been joined by two greats of the game. Greg Rosetsky is here, and so too Peter Fleming, two men who've played at um, the greatest venues, and I imagine in their younger days in particular, one or two dives. I'm not saying David Lloyd Heston's a dive, by the way, but I'm sure they've, they've sampled some of the less glamorous parts of the world. Peter, especially during your illustrious Davis Cup career, what, what would you pick out as the, as the best venue you ever performed in and the worst one? Well, I don't know. It, w the venue, Buenos Aires Tennis Club, I think, was, was uh, a really exciting place. 7,000 people with, you know, bands and drums, and, and it was raucous. Mexico City also, the place where they, they chucked us with those cushions. 5,000 people going crazy again. So it was Latin American venues were uh, pretty intense um, it wasn't so exciting at home where we were a bit stayed the American crowd but uh, um, you know Madison Square Garden you can't beat that venue that was that wasn't a Davis Cup venue but uh, for me that was the best because I grew up outside there watching the New York Knicks play and, and it was just to go home it was the Mecca and you had some fantastic success there as well Greg, I remember seeing you at Wimbledon, strutting your stuff at the US Open. Of course, you got to the final at the wonderful Flushing Meadows. Um, what's top of your list? Well, I think top of my list, you know, Wimbledon is always the special. I think playing your first match on the center court, just the quietness and all the great champions you've seen play. The, the McEnroe Borg final of 80 and 81 were two of the best matches I'd ever seen. And that was my dream was to play on the center court. And, it's a special moment when you lose your first set 6-1 because you're overawed by the situation, but then find a way to win that match. And I mean, we're very lucky that we have some amazing venues. Obviously, Arthur Ashe Stadium is spectacular. 97, when I got the finals, it was the first time it was ever used, and uh, 24,000 people watching uh, was, was incredible. But if I think about Davis Cup, like Peter's talking about, I think in Ecuador, in the bull ring, again, with fans that knew nothing about tennis, about only knew about football, were throwing coins at us the whole time. It was loud. When, we'd, when their opponents would win a point, it would be so loud. When we'd win a point, it was dead silence, as if it wasn't allowed to happen out there. And also playing in Birmingham at the NEC was spectacular as well, because from a British point of view, playing America, the 100th year of the Davis Cup as well, was incredible atmosphere. Fantastic memories. I just wonder, with Felix, um, you know, getting used now to playing some big matches, not necessarily with huge crowds. How, how do you think you'd be affected walking out in front of 17,000 people, some of whom may not be cheering in your general direction? Yeah, well, I have to say I'm not really used to that. I'm not sure how I would deal with it. I think I would be a bit overwhelmed because obviously I haven't really had that much experience, but I think after a while I probably would get used to it and just kind of come to terms with some people who aren't really cheering for me and then kind of use that as a positive to motivate myself a bit more. Well, actually, for, for those youngsters who are maybe just starting to sample that sort of atmosphere, maybe Peter and, and Greg can come up with some advice. Or, I mean, when you were younger, Peter, you could be a little bit well, feisty at times. What um, do you mean when he was younger? He still is feisty. Don't get him angry this early in, in the I podcast. Know, make it much more interesting, though, if he does. I just wonder what sort of advice, Pete, you could give to, to some young guys who maybe will, sooner rather than later, have to deal with potentially alien environments that obviously you don't get when you're 12, 13 or 14? Well, everybody has to do it themselves, really. I mean, they have to figure it out for themselves. As Greg said, the first time I walked on center court at Wimbledon, uh, it was a double semi-final, and, and we lost the first set in 11 minutes. I mean, I was just so nervous. I couldn't see straight. Um, luckily, we, we, I, I kind of figured it out, and, and uh, we won that match. But but, you know, you, you just have to deal with it. Everybody deals with it slightly differently. We saw it today. Dominic Team was nervous in the first match, and, and he's played here, what, three or four times before? Um, it, it took him a while to, to figure it out, and yet Kevin Anderson came out in his very first match here and, and had it figured out within three minutes. You know, he, the first game was look, looked a, a little dicey, and then, then he was solid as a rock. And so... You know, there is no advice to, to how to get over pre-match nerves. You just have to figure it out. Did you have a way, or did you just figure things out, Greg? Well, I, I think you've got to remember the court is the same dimensions no matter how many people are out there. And I think you've got to love playing in front of a big crowd, and you've got to learn to be comfortable being uncomfortable. And that's what the very best do. They, they really never allow it to bother them. And it, it was interesting. I remember Paul Anacone telling me a story about Sampras playing 
Becker at these end of season championships. 18,000 people against him, all going for Boris. He said, Peter, are you all right? He said, no, I love this. 18,000 people booing me and cheering against me. Couldn't ask for anything better. And that's an unusual sort of mindset. That's the mindset of a champion. So, and as Peter says, just go out there, enjoy the moment. You know, the crowd might get on your nerves or they might go against you but the dimensions of the court don't change. And this is where you find out where your character is and putting yourself in that position more often will make you more comfortable being in that environment. Well, that's some good advice. Next time you go and play a tough national match somewhere, uh, Felix, the, the words of uh, Greg and Peter will hopefully be ringing inside your head. Hopefully they will be. Yeah. Uh, by the way, Barry Cowan has joined us and um, shortly he'll be explaining why his pick at the uh, the next gen finals last week didn't quite materialize but just before greg and and peter go i just want to get their thoughts on that match we've just seen and, and some predictions uh because it was a terrific start to the world tour finals as you've hinted at peter uh, kevin anderson on debut one in straight sets fantastic second set tie break how far do you think he can go in the championship well he could he could go he could win it you know, it's, uh, let's, I'm not going to bet on him to win it, but, but he certainly could with a game like that. If he, if he um, you know, just rides the wave a little bit, these conditions are perfect for him. And in terms of Dominic team, he's not made the semifinals in his two previous visits here, Greg. And obviously, with, he's, you're not out of it in the round, Robin, but with Roger Federer also in the group, he's, he's already got his work cut out, hasn't he? It would take a miracle for him to qualify for the semis, let's be honest. I mean, he has to play consistency like he did in that second set and find a way to win those sorts of tight tiebreakers. Historically, he doesn't like this court, and he's got Nishikuri and he's got Federer, so he's got to most likely beat both of them to qualify, and that is a big ask. But you said to me at the start of our first Sky program today, no one is going to stop Novak Djokovic, and I don't suppose you're going to change your mind about that. No, not at the moment, but you know, I'm looking forward to seeing Federer tonight because I think Federer is probably the guy who's got the best chance to do so. And even for Novak, that first match is going to be tough tomorrow against John Isner, the big serving American. Even though he has the greatest return to serve, in my opinion, ever in the game of sport, Isner is a handful for anybody, but he is the man to beat. Greg, I know you love your food, so uh, we're going to let you head off. And actually, good story, Felix. I've got to tell you this one. A few years ago, Greg tried all five puddings that they had out in the caravan and we said Greg they're quite rich be careful ah, I'll be fine he said I'll be fine <laughs> had all five we came in to do the show Greg had to disappear for about five minutes looking no, no, very I green no, around no, no, the face no, I never disappointed I made it in within the 90 seconds of the breaks and I got back on air that's all I'm gonna say I'm gonna leave you with that some of us are still professional we can manage those things. he was very professional Greg thank you very much thank indeed you. and uh, Peter I know you're gonna have your food as well but um Thank you very much for, for the advice, and, and hopefully young Felix will benefit from that. Good luck, gentlemen. Thank you very much indeed. Mr. Cowan will be here in just a moment. Um, in terms of, of the match and being here just as a, as a fan today, Felix, how, how big a buzz was it? No, it was really good. Haven't been here for a while. I think the last time I came here when I was about six years old. So not many memories, really, but I think that it was really good to see the top players playing at this high level. Sometimes when you're watching tournaments, you don't really see the top players play each other in the first round or even in the round robin. So I think it was really good to get a good perspective of you know, today's game and how well they're really playing. And also, when you're watching a match on TV, you don't really understand how hard and how fast and the spin they're putting on the ball because of the camera mm. angle. So I think it's also good to see it in real life to really appreciate how much and how physical the game of tennis is at this day and age. Yeah, absolutely right. And in terms of the crowd around you, I mean, obviously, people have their favourites, but could you identify that either Anderson or team was getting the bulk of the support? out there or did people just want to see a great match? Um, I think team was getting more support, he was getting more kind of calls out from the crowd, uh, ask, telling him come on let's go, um, but I think it wasn't too much to one side, I think that they were generally about the same really, I think I, I, I personally was going for team as well, I think that he was a bit more the underdog, uh, lower seeding, and I also like his character as well. He's got really nice technique, and that is really what made me him want to win. Okay, well, in a moment, I'm going to find out who you're tipping to win the World Tour Finals. But before that, let's bring in Mr. Cowan, who was very kind to talk to us before he headed off to Milan for the, uh, the next gen finals, telling us all in a very confident voice that Andre Rublev was going to be the so winner. I still want to speak to me, Marcus. <laughs> well, we... well as, I, as I say, you're only as good as your last match, and he won his last match. That's true. He finished third. 
He did. However, my prediction was a year ago. So for ATP Tennis Radio, we do a time capsule, which actually you should do for next year, Marcus. So you have to predict your next-gen winner, your O2 winner, your top eight, your four winners of the slams, which I know you got horribly wrong for the US Open, didn't you? Well, I had Del Potro for the US Open. Yeah. I got the others all right, though. Yeah. I'll, Did you? I'll have you yeah. know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but how, how fun was, was the week out there? How do you think it went? I think it was a lot of fun. And what was clear last year, because I did last year as well, that what's clear was the players felt important. And I think that was almost initially was a part of one of the reasons why Chris Camo wanted to get it, to start it off. And obviously to the, the rules as well, the innovation of the rules. But when you're making that transition from being a great junior to hopefully one day being top 10 or top 20 you go through those difficult years and you can kind of get lost where your self-esteem is crushed a bit so you can sort of feel around 60 or 70 in the world which we know is an incredible standard but maybe they lose a bit a little bit of that self-confidence but last year they were striving to reach the top top eight and this year was the was the same and i thought the standard was was very very impressive and the two people that stuck out not just uh, on court, the two players, City Pass and Di Manoa, making the final, but just off court. Mentally, they, they were ahead of the pack, and, and obviously City Pass had had an amazing year, but Di is one of my favourites. Mm. He's such an exciting brand of tennis. And we have to doff our cap to young Felix because he did tip City Pass to win, so uh, I guess you weren't surprised by what happened. Uh, well, actually, well, like, I thought Di Manoa was going to win the final, but I st- uh, tipped sits a pass because I think he's just got a really solid game. He's quite big as a person, so he had a lot of power coming into the final. Uh, he's obviously seed number one, so all of those kind of stacked up in his favour, and that kind of what made me choose him. So he, do you know? You know what? You never change your pick, Felix. That's right, Marcus, isn't it? Coming from you, you've changed it every, after every set of a match. <laughs> as a general, I do. What, he has got a, obviously a, a lot of talent, a lot of ability, a bit of temper. I think everyone would have seen the uh, the incident with. The headset, but um, you know, in, in general terms, he, to quote Greg, looks to be the real deal, doesn't he? I love that emotion. I think that's great. I mean, any, anyone that can honestly say, in the heat of the battle, at times they haven't lost their cool. I was going to actually ask Felix. As I presume you saw him lose his temper. Did you quite like that? Could you relate to that a little bit more? Because it's the hardest part, isn't it, of, of any junior, when the going gets tough and the pressure's on, is to keep your cool. Yeah, and no, I see a lot of people, at, especially at a young age losing their temper much more, uh, especially in under 10s, under 12s, rather than in under 18s, it's a bit less. Mm-hmm. But I still think that emotion kind of showed how much it meant to him, mm-hmm. how much passion he really gives into tennis and how much he, it means to him to you know, go further. Because what, sorry, 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 what is so, everyone loses their temper, but it's what you do after that. And I thought, Marcus, mm-hmm. that's what was so impressive, that he was just going crazy. But then the next, but after the change of hands, he was so focused, and I was sitting courtside. Had a, a great, I was able to see him. I was within about ten meters of him losing losing the plot, but I was also very close. The next point, he was right on it, and, and I think those are the types of things that that really struck home to me. This is the interesting point, though, Baron and Felix in particular will relate to this because, of course, sometimes you have to get that angst out of you. If you try doing that at junior level, Felix, in a you know a grade two, a grade three, or whatever you're going to get serious code violations, points and all the rest of it, and, and a ban can come along very quickly. So it, it's, it's difficult in a way, Barry, for, for the young guys and girls to see players understandably getting things out of their system. But, but if they do the same thing, they are dealt with very harshly. Is, is that the right thing to do to kids at that age? I do think you have to penalise them, but I think also there has to be an understanding. And I think that's what's also important, that when, as long as you're... As long as after the match you've got the right guidance, either by your coach or parental input, I think you've got to say the right things. Because what you don't want to do, and I, and I was fiery, believe it or not, as a, as oh, I can believe it, <laughs> was that you don't want to get kicked out of you because you, you you are what you are. Not everyone's going to be like Borg or Federer, and not everyone is going to be like City Pass last week. It's it's about understanding your own personality and. Uh, I think that's the hardest part. You've got to, you've got to learn. You've got to learn by your mistakes. And, but for City Pass, he's got such such a bright future. He's going to the very top. And actually, I've watched you play a few times, Felix. I think you're quite best in a way. You, you're not one of the, the crazy guys, are you? Not le- Well, not too often, at least. No, I like to keep my emotions in check. I think some players like to let, let it go, kind of get it out of their system. But I think some players... It depends really who you're playing. Some players 
that you're playing against and when you get angry they kind of use it to their advantage, some don't. Uh, but I think mostly on the court I like to keep it calm uh, so I don't kind of get too frustrated or too happy in a point because then it, I think it really affects my game. Mm -hmm. There's also one thing that I think has become really apparent. Obviously here in doubles, and we've had it for many years, is sudden death of Juice. And there was an incident with Moonar in his very first match where he was down 30-40 match point. He played an amazing point and celebrated, but you're still in trouble. Mm. And the next point, he had, a, he had a smash on top of the net that he missed. So picking up what Felix said, it's about, yes, when you want to get excited, you've still got a very important point to come. And if you, if you get your emotions too high, it's quite difficult to come back down to um, emotionally to be able to be composed for the next point. Well, in terms of who should be excited about the next few days, um, obviously you're one from one. You tipped Tsitsipas, and he duly did the business in Milan. So who are you tipping to uh, walk out on court next Sunday evening and become the O2 champion? Well, there are so many good players here. I'm going to